Hey all, so I have a very fun episode for you today. I am here after five years, almost exactly five years, I'm here at Steve's Leaves. And I have been buying from Steve for, I don't need, I probably a decade now. But Steve has been in business for over 40 years, I think exactly 46 years. So we're gonna chat with him today about just all the things that he has seen over that time of running his business here and even seeing some of the cool plants that he's growing right now. So Steve, it's been five years since we've seen each other here at your space. Give me an overview of really what has changed in those last five years? Well, things have changed tremendously here, and the uh, I would say the biggest change that comes to mind is we went from uh, concentrating on wholesale customers, which is what I've done for so many years, selling to supermarket chains and other wholesale customers, to selling completely online. And that's a huge change. The difference in the types of crops we're growing and everything has changed tremendously and also watching the trends and trying to stay ahead of them and all that is so there's uh, we didn't have that challenge before so let's back up a bit because for those people who are unfamiliar with Steve's leaves or who may be familiar but just don't know the history how long have you been physically in business since 1976 I uh, made official uh, got my uh, tax ID and everything, uh, partly so I could buy wholesale. So it's been 46 years now. And, you know, obviously this goes without saying, but there wasn't an ability to do an online business, obviously, in 1976. So wholesale was basically the way to go back then. Is Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Unless you go maybe direct mail or, right, if you will. There were some places doing that. Yeah. Okay, so then, you know, here, here you are in 1976, and there is a big boom during the 70s in foliage plants, right? Mm -hmm. There is an interest there. Absolutely. A, lot, a of the, lot of boomers got in into plants at that time. I was giving a talk yesterday, and I was showcasing the sale of foliage plants, and 1976 now looks like a blip on the radar compared to now. Right. So tell me, like, even if you have to, like, talk about, like, over the decades, how things shifted over the decades, over the last 40 plus years in business? Well, c considering I started out, well, started when I was 13 as a hobby, but when I was 18 and, and made it a, a business on the side, I started with selling to florists, to uh, small nurseries, independent uh, garden centers. And uh, in 1986 was my big break, I guess, sold to my first supermarket chain. And there was a, a chain, well, it's still there, but it was the dominant chain at the time. And the buyer wouldn't have anything to do with me. I'd call and, and she'd ask for an availability and price list. And she had no idea what the plants I was growing were. So I was lucky enough to stumble up upon one of their stores where they did a lot of the training, had the ability to buy from people who were not on the vendors list. So that was a huge chain, change. And so uh, as people were trained there, they wanted my plants in their stores. So I, uh, they kept getting permissions from their store managers. Meanwhile, the buyer wouldn't approve me. And so I got into quite a few of their stores. There's some of their best stores. And one day the buyer called and it's like, okay, the game's up now, <laughs> this is it. And it turned out she wanted me to cover, uh, I was covering just part of Dallas. She wanted me to cover all of Dallas and all of Fort Worth and uh, she was expanding it. So, you know, she wouldn't give me the time of day before, but I guess I proved myself with my uh, quality and unusual plants. But the result of that, to suddenly be able to supply a chain, I had to go from growing a lot of variety down to specializing so I could produce enough of any one thing. So um, uh, narrowed it down to one type of a butylon and to Hypoestes uh, Pink Splash, and then further narrowed it to Pink Splash. And so for many years, I was that was pretty much all I grew, but I had my personal collection, but that's what I was known for, for supermarkets and Pink Splash. Wow, it's unbelievable yeah. because, you know, even when I came here five years ago, you did have a, like a nice little selection. Like it might have been like, you know, pushed to a corner or whatever, but the, the fact that you were only doing basically one mm -hmm. is quite crazy. And that was around the 
in the 80s and early mm -hmm. 90s then? Correct. So was there ever plant frenzy kind of died back out, out of all those decades and you were just like, oh, this is so hard, like <laughs> where you had just had to evolve and say, you know, should I continue this? Did you ever have any of those moments or oh, doubts? Yeah, it was more than a moment. <laughs> uh, those years, a very dark year. So uh, what happened with the supermarket chains, at one point I had half a dozen chains and their business model uh, chain changed. And so they started, uh, they got rid of what they called their foliage wall. And they concentrated on cut flowers and some potted blooming plants. Uh, and the margins for those were were so small, it just wasn't worth the trouble. Mm -hmm. So suddenly my customer base changed and it was one of those many times I had to reinvent the business. And uh, I was kind of in a panic and uh, came very close to bankruptcy. Uh, actually had the papers in my hand to, to declare bankruptcy because we had just to make payroll and everything. At that time, it, it meant more than it does now, but we had $100,000 on personal credit cards, just on cash advances to make payroll. It seemed like there wasn't any light at the end of the tunnel. And that was the late 90s uh, when my kids were small and growing up. Unfortunately, we were very, very poor then. Couldn't really do a, a whole lot. We did inexpensive family activities. But anyway, what I did was I went on a, um, a grower tour visiting other growers uh, to see what was working for them and trying to figure it out. But they were all so much bigger than I was and a lot of what I found out wasn't relevant, couldn't be applied to what I was doing. But actually, all of a sudden, uh, a pattern emerged after, uh, you know, it just being very random from grower to grower in that uh, Home Depot was expanding rapidly. And that seemed to be the place to be. They were treating their growers very well. And so with a great deal of effort, I was able to finally get in to uh, meet with a buyer. And then after a 20 minute meeting, I was approved. And that was, I think about 25 years ago. And things took off even more at that point. And then we were able to because go of back to- the scale to, then of Home Depot. Do you think it was this, like just the scale of Home Depot that it took off? So I, I think it's the, the traffic they had. And, and that's the, the, the the problems with the retail nurseries that I've had over the years is they're very seasonal. And especially here in Texas, once it gets hot, their parking lots are, uh, I don't know, if I, are pretty much empty. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I, um, the wrong people aren't watching this, but <laughs> anyway, um, but that's just a, a fact of how it works. And so the supermarkets and, and here I am like the smallest grower around and the supermarket chains and, the, and Home Depot you know, or these massive sellers of, of product, but they have year-round traffic. And that was always my secret. People would like, why on earth? You should be selling to these, the little guys. And I did as much as I could. There are many people I gave tours to mm -hmm. who were doing terrariums out of their home or whatever, trying to, to help their small, even smaller businesses than mine, which is, is, is uh, saying a lot, because mine was awfully small. But anyway, yeah, so it was the, the traffic that they had that made the difference. Yeah, so then how did you have to cater to them? Because before, in, in the supermarket, you were doing like one pink splash. Mm -hmm. Like how did you have to cater and, to Home Depot? And we, we did the pink splash in at least a dozen different ways, different sizes, and I used to have baskets custom made and custom painted and all this custom stuff to, to decorate them. Well, that fancy stuff didn't go over at Home Depot. Uh, they wanted the unusual varieties. And to my delight, I was able to take all these uh, plants that we didn't have in production, in my personal collection, and put them in uh, production. So that was, it, it made things much more complicated, but it was made it more interesting for me and my employees. Yeah. Did things change along the way with Home Depot? Like I would imagine <laughs> with like large corporations, they start to listen to their shareholders a little bit more mm -hmm. <laughs> and cut costs. Well, um, I'm going to try to watch my words carefully. This I don't want to make any enemies. Verbal tightrope walking. But yes, uh, but uh, quite frankly, they started uh, something that they still continue to do called pay by scan around 2011 I think it was that that we were switched and um, and it turns out everything's on consignment so big problem two big problems really um, it, one is the obvious one that they often didn't water their plants which became my plants since they were on consignment 
And so the plants would die, I would never get paid because they weren't, wouldn't go through the register. But the bigger thing was the other, again, I'm the smallest grower around, the big guys had their merchandisers in there every day and they, what they wanted our space, they would get over shipped uh, a product and not know where to put it. So they'd throw our plants away. So we'd deliver them and they'd get thrown away. So And you'd never get paid for them because no one could actually buy them. Correct. Then. And if it's pay by scan, essentially, then if somebody doesn't scan or, or buy or walk out with mm -hmm. your product, you don't get paid. Correct. So and you, then they deduct it from me every time something's returned too. Right. So, which is, you know, they have a policy where if something breaks or you don't want it, you could just return it. And mm -hmm. that may, might make sense for a hammer. I <laughs> saw people who just came in and said, I don't have the dead plants and I don't have a receipt, even though the employees ask and they demanded their money and they got it. And it was just, all you had to do is go in and say that uh, uh, you you had bought some plants and lost them. So so this put this put you into a probably a, a big predicament because um, you know that just seems unfair. You're dealing with living organisms and you have no control over the people watering and caring for your plants because they're essentially they're not your employees. Right. And my wife was adamant, and as I as I, was I, that uh, we not go back to what we went through in the late 90s uh, because we started losing money. So had to reinvent the business again and figure out pay by scan. And lots of growers uh, went out of business, uh, large growers and uh, more sophisticated growers. Uh, but uh, uh, this tiny little speck of a grower, uh, I was able to figure things out and made it profitable. But it, it was really uh, rough. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's their right, I suppose, to, to do, you know, whatever business model they feel works for them as long as there are growers willing to, to do that. So that's I when I saw I needed to switch to something else and, and online seemed the way to go, but go ahead. Yeah, I would imagine that it just takes a lot of the joy though out of growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, how did you how did you feel about it? Like during the height of it, if you could put yourself back into your own shoes during that time, what were you thinking? Like, uh, like I, I, cause I could only imagine like what I would, I would have had some disgust, I guess. Yeah, well, you probably don't expect me to zig or zag this direction, but as you probably know, uh, we had a, I had a, uh, owned with my oldest son, a professional fireworks display company where we did shows for sports teams and cities and, and for weddings and all that. That was making money right around, doing really well right around the time that uh, Pay By Scan came along. So it was very tempting, or I had a lot of, let me, it wasn't tempting, I had a lot of family pressure to shut this down at that point because I had another route. My head understood that, my heart just couldn't, um, I mean, I, I walked through thinking about closing down the business with tears in my eyes. I remember uh, one day just, okay, I'm gonna make the decision right now, and I walked through and it's like, I can't do it.
stuck it out, figured it out, diversified my customer base, and decided to go toward online. And really, uh, you're a big part of that because you were here five years ago and kind of put us uh, uh, on people's radar that, that hadn't heard of us because we didn't have an advertising budget. We didn't weren't doing any advertising. It was just word of mouth, and mostly still is, I think. But but anyway, the, that, mouth, the mouth got a lot, a lot larger. Yeah, yes. <laughs> There's yeah. more mouths. Yes, I remember someone saying that uh, we were their little secret and how dare you expose their secret source of yeah, plants. Yeah, I think I remember that uh, as well. Yeah, I, I was buying from you for quite some time and it was largely your selection of peperomia that really drew me in and I'm a, a big fan of peperomia and you had such really wonderful selections so it was such a pleasure to actually come and see your operation and when we met you were discussing about how you wanted to transition from Home Depot and that pay by scan and you already had a, an online business you were available mm -hmm. online so right. it just wasn't going anywhere at the time right and right with you and with millennials and all that everything changed that, yeah. that uh, suddenly plants were popular again as you said it's nothing it's it's the most popular since the 70s, but it's not the same as in the 70s. People In the 70s, people just wanted a typical Florida foliage, tropical plant. Uh, now people are, are much more sophisticated and they know what rare things they're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think that you had always, I mean, at least when I saw you on your online business, you always catered to a certain degree to a, a bit of a collector, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. now it seems like I, I walk here and you have even more plants that would be suitable for mm -hmm. collectors. Mm -hmm. And it is because now you could focus on that mm -hmm. because you are essentially free to retail direct to consumer mm -hmm. and, and you know what the consumer wants and you could uh, cater to it, which is wonderful. And yet another time I had to reinvent the business and figure things out. Yeah. And, and now with the help of my staff, my team, I don't even come in every day anymore that I have a, a great uh, team that runs things for me. And, and they're now a lot more knowledgeable on some of these uh, rare things, the more trendy things than I am. Because yeah. I, I knew what I knew back then. And I'm a plant pack rat, I, I call myself. And I built up, you know, uh, I think we, they were counting at one point, but I, I we, at, Many, many years ago, we counted, we had about a thousand varieties. I think we think we have maybe 2,000 varieties now. Amazing. In, well, in a very small amount of space, uh, grower-wise. Well, I can't remember, yeah, what it was when, when I was here, but it, it seemed like quite a lot. But I do believe we did the first unboxing of Steve's Leaves on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know if anybody ever unboxed your houseplants before that. I don't think so. <laughs> As you've been seeing from Plant One On Me's, I came back from Louisville, Texas with Steve's leaves and I actually had a chance to check out his whole total sum of plants. It's pretty much around, I would say, 1200 different types of species, cultivars, and varieties. So he had a lot to choose from. So you may notice that I have this big box right here of live plants so I think I might have gotten spoiled rotten from Steve because I got to select some really interesting varieties so I thought we'd do an unboxing ceremony I mean I, I love these things I know you guys are like real big plant nerds and you really love to see all these really interesting varieties of plants in the home but why not show them as they're coming out of their packages but then after that, I was like, look at all the unboxing of Steve's leaves that happened uh -huh. <laughs> that. Look what you started. It was and, definitely a domino effect. Mm -hmm. And yeah, funny thing about that is you, I didn't really know who you were. I, I recognized the name because it was an unusual name. Uh, and the, all the orders used to come through my inbox because there weren't that many. Mm -hmm. And so I recognized the name. And, and one time we had a call, you called and asked some questions and all. And next thing I knew you wanted to come here. I didn't know anything about you. I actually, my employees started telling me when you were, after we shot the, the you shot the uh, videos uh, five years ago, when you were on the way to the airport. And they said, oh no, she's done this and this. And, and I, I didn't know any of that when we uh, did those uh, videos. Uh, but uh, I do remember uh, mentioning to you when you said you're going to do an unboxing um, that um, I think I suggested doing it on Thanksgiving because there probably wouldn't be a big audience because 
who's going to want to see an unboxing? It shows how little I know, uh, because it was a, a very popular thing, as you said, and many other people have done that since. Yeah. Yeah, it's so funny because like you think that on YouTube everything had existed up until that point. And people were always doing technology unboxings and things along those lines, but like plant unboxings didn't really exist. It's so strange to think about it. But now, you know, it's like everybody does an unboxing just to be like, look at what I've got, because there's a surprise element to it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I've always struggled with these, that they always have them on like one of their boards or sphagnum moss poles or whatever, and I'm always tempted to like remove them, but you have to remove them so carefully because the little aerial roots that are sticking out from the back, you could damage the plant very easily and you could, you could break the plant very easily. So I often just leave the, the board in there. Another peperomia. This one is a stunner. This one is Peperomia viridis. It's a variegated version. I think that Steve has had this variety for a very, very long time. It's pretty easy to take care of. It can get pretty leggy, so I've actually cut some of mine back because they, if you're not giving it the, the most appropriate optimal light, then it could get leggy, but you can, as I said, slice them back so it has a little bit more of a compact growth. Let's see what's next. And the people with who love like variegated or uh, chimeric plants will probably love that one because it has a little bit of yellow green variegation in its leaves. This one's a unique one. They encouraged me to take this one. It has a little bit like that Pilea peperomioides look. So it has this roundish leaf. This is um, Peperomia keratropha, it looks like. I didn't, I wasn't familiar with this one, but. I mean, honestly, I think that, you know, whenever we post videos and things, people who are familiar with your plants are always like, Steve's leaves, love his plants, they pack so well, you know, everything along those lines. So I think you have overall rave reviews and real kudos to you, Steve, for just sticking it out, being true to your passion and showing that sometimes it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy doing something that you love and, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to grow and evolve and, you know, try to be nimble in the face of pressure from family and friends and things along those lines. A, a piece of advice, business advice I've heard many times is uh, the worst reason to start a business is because it's something you like. You should uh, start the business because you know you can make a profit and all that. And I found because I was so passionate about plants, I stuck with it through thick and thin and was just uh, holding on, would not let it go, even though there were some really uh, dark times, I stuck with it and was able to make it work out. So for me, if I just picked something just for the money and wasn't passionate about it, it wouldn't have been the same. I would have bailed first time uh, there was a rough patch. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think that anybody who gives the advice otherwise, your, your soul would feel a little lost. I mean, I don't think I could stick with anything myself if, if I didn't love what I did, you know, because it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like right. a grind. You, you work to figure out how you can make it, make you a living, you know, at the end of the day. But it's it feels like your life and you, you feel passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I feel like the analog to that bad advice would be, you know, only marry somebody for money and not love. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, and that, that seems like a bad idea too. Correct. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's so similar. But yeah, well, yeah. thank you, Steve, for sticking it out, showing people that, you know, stick with your passion and to work hard along the way to, to make that passion work, even when it feels like uh, you're up against some challenges. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Stay tuned on Plant One On Me for more botanical tours, talks, and how-tos. And if you're looking to further your knowledge on the plant kingdom, then have a look at our various online courses from Troubleshoot Your House Plants to the House Plant Masterclass. Additionally, we have a second channel we started last year called Flock Finger Lakes, where we cover more on outdoor gardening, habitat restoration, agroforestry, and even more. So check that out if that interests you. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next episode.